Hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners five days a week. Today, we have a very special guest. We're joined by Jeff Hayden. Jeff is a contributing editor um, to Inc. Magazine and a LinkedIn influencer. Um, today, we'll, we'll be delving into his most recent book, The Motivation Myth, um, How High Achievers Really Set Themselves Up to Win. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great, Chris. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, Jeff, fill in the gaps. Tell our listeners uh, a little bit about yourself and also what inspired you to write a book on motivation? <laughs> All right. Well, the, the, the part about myself is going to be really short um, <laughs> because I'm pretty boring. I worked in manufacturing for 20 years. I started at entry level. And by entry level, I mean the very bottom of the ladder. Uh, I worked my way through college in a manufacturing plant. And when I got out, I decided I wanted to keep doing that. So I was the stereotypical college boy on the shop floor. But that was okay. And I worked my way up and eventually ran a plant had about a thousand people that reported to me. We had a variety of experiences all along the way. All of that was awesome, but that had always been my goal to run a plant. I always thought I could. And then when I got there after about three years, I thought, yes, I can. And wow, this isn't what I hoped it would be. <laughs> so I decided, uh, decided to do something different. And my wife actually pushed me and said, what would you really like to do? And I said, well, I think I would like to try to write. I was never a dream dream but it was something I was interested in. And so she said, well, try it for a year. If it doesn't work out, you can always go back, which is good advice. And so I did that. So that's kind of how I got that started. As far as the motivation myth part in this book, um, I was sitting with Kirk Hammett, the Metallica guitarist, who, if you're going to drop a name, that's a pretty good name. That's a good name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, it's a pretty cool one. Um, and he was talking about, you know, becoming a musician. And he has a variety of other interests and things that he's excelled at. And at no point did he ever say, you know, one day I got this lightning bolt of motivation, inspiration, and I found my passion, and this was my life's course. He said, I, I just liked the guitar and decided I wanted to try to play better. And then the process of learning and playing better made him want to keep doing that. And so I thought about all the other successful people I've talked to. None of them have that lightning bolt moment. They're all people that had an interest and then followed it. And over time it became a passion and it became part of their, you know, their life's purpose. Contrast that to all the people who talk to me and ask me questions about, wow, I feel stuck. I haven't found my passion. I haven't found my thing. I don't know what to do. I'm waiting for this big jolt of motivation and they never do anything. And so I thought, well, here's, here's a huge problem because most people think that motivation is something that comes to you from some mysterious external <laughs> force and suddenly you found it, but you've got to wait and you can't do anything in the meantime because wow, that would be wasted time because tomorrow I'm going to realize that I need to be Beyonce or something. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the foundation of it is that if you feel stuck or you have something you want to accomplish, you don't have to have this never ending source of motivation to get you going. You just have to start and you have to commit to saying, okay, for a week and a half, maybe two weeks, no matter how painful this is, no matter how badly I do, no matter how awkward I feel, I'm going to try. And if you give it that long, there will be these little successes that you will have where you'll learn a little something or you'll get a little bit better or you'll get a little better, you'll get in a little better shape, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you'll come out and say, you know, this is pretty cool. That's fun because it's fun to succeed even in really small doses. And that gratification you get, that's where your motivation comes from because like, wow, I feel good about myself. That was fun. I worked hard. I learned something. I've, I've gotten better. I think I'll keep going. And if you get into a process where you are working towards becoming something and you get those small doses of motivation, you're creating your own motivation over the long term, as opposed to that one big storehouse. So I know that was a really long explanation, No, but it's, it's why I think so many people get stuck because they're waiting for that big thing. And you can create your own big thing through a lot of little things. Yeah. No, I, I think it's fascinating. And um, when, I, when I came across your explanation for it, it kind of clicked to what I've been thinking about for so long now. Because so many people ask me, I, people that know me, I, I'm, I, I'm good at random things. So <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I'll, I'll explain. Um, I've been a break dancer at a very Ooh. high level. You know, I play wow. snooker. I play ice hockey. I do sales. I do so many other, I do art. And people, how are you good at so many different things? And, 
and why, what motive motivates you? And I didn't know until I heard you say that, that unconsciously I took the same approach to every single one of those things. And what it was is just starting, just right. trying new things. And when I tried those things, I was like, Oh, I like this. And then it motivated me to con- continue to do it. But that was obviously unconsciously. I wasn't conscious of that, but now I've become conscious of that. I'm, it's actually even more exciting because I'm now taking that approach to new things and then it ends up motivating me to do even more. So the people that you found that are successful, were they, were they conscious that they were doing this or was it completely unconscious and that's just how, how they did that? A couple points. Early on for most of them, it was unconscious. It was like, I have an interest, let me try to follow that. But they were disciplined enough to put some effort in. You know, there, there's that, there's that whole, yeah. you know, I want to run a marathon. If I go out today and run that first mile and it's hard, well, a lot of people quit after the first day if they go into a mile. You know, it's like, wow, the distance from here to there is just too great and I'm going to bail. So the, the successful people were at least disciplined enough to say, you know, I'm going to hang in here for a little bit. And at some point I may decide this is not right for me and that's okay. And that it was a really interesting point you brought up about all the, as you call them, random things you're good at. <laughs> Another thing that people get stuck on is they think that I have to choose one pursuit that I can specialize in and that's going to carry me all the way through. And if I get four or five years into something and I've gotten pretty good at it, but I'm no longer interested, well, what a waste that is because I've wasted that five years. Well, that's crap. (laughs) You know, you've got all these interests. You've taken them to different levels and different places. Some of them, you're probably not that worried about getting a whole lot better, but you carry all that with you. And let's say that, I don't know, break dancing, which fascinates me and you'll have to talk (laughs) more about that. But if you got to a certain skill level and you said, you know, this is really fun, but it's not really going anywhere. And I've, I've gotten all I want out of that. And I want to do something different. You haven't wasted any of that time because Mm -hmm. You've gotten experiences through that that you carry with you. You've gotten some physical skills, but you've gotten mental skills as well. There's all kinds of stuff that you carry with you. So the idea that you have to have one path, and if you stray from it, then you're wasting your time, that is really silly. And I'm a, I'm a perfect example of that because I worked in manufacturing for 20 years. That should have been my life. I put so much time into that that you could look at that and say, dude, you know, you're know, you running a plant. Yeah. Why are you quitting to go off and be on your own, do a job where right now you don't have a single client. Well, I didn't quite do it that way. I worked on the side and, you know, but it was pretty, it sounds stupid, but actually it's not because all those experiences helped inform me when I wrote about business leadership, entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. management, all of that stuff. I carried all that with me. So I'm not just a writer who writes about things. I've got all that experience and I can write about it. Yeah. Uh, so, so to go back to your very, your original question early on, most of those people didn't say, Hey, I've cracked the code here and I know how this works. They just gave it a try. The cool thing is though, that it does work. And like you said, you can be purposeful about it and say, mm-hmm. you know what? I know how this works. I know if I decide that I want to, we'll use my marathon example, run a marathon the first two weeks, it's not going to be fun and I'm not going to get very far if I've never even gone jogging, yeah. but I know that Do you expect and I it? know how that yeah. works. And yeah. so I know within a week or two, I'm going to be in a little better shape. I'll be able to run a little bit farther. This will start to click and then I will be able to keep advancing. And so they figure that part out. And like you said, it is very empowering because it's like, wait a minute, I can do about anything I want to, as long yeah. as I put in a little bit of effort for a little while and get over that hump, and start rolling and get my little virtuous flywheel of success, gratification, yeah. motivation going. Yeah, it's, I, I do think it's a switch in mentality in a lot of cases, uh, how people look at that. I, I, myself and my business partner are the same where we, we see a challenge and we just run straight at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if something's painful and, I, and, I, and I, I find it really hard, I'm strangely attracted to more, more so to doing more of that. And, well, that's, uh, a, that's a really cool approach, too, because if <laughs> you're doing something that's hard, that by definition means that a lot of people are going to avoid doing it. So you have a chance to stand out, you know, right away. If you're the one that is doing what no one else is willing to do, you right away are going to stand out. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, I kind of made a manufacturing career out of that. I was the <laughs> guy that would volunteer for the things that no one else would do. Yeah. And I, I became that guy. I just used air quotes, but I became that guy. And, 
that helped me later on get picked for a lot of projects and opportunities because people knew, all right, well, if we ask him to do it, he's going to do it. <laughs> Nobody else will. Um, yeah. so, it was, so it was pretty cool. Yeah. Good. And you refer to this, but going back to our point earlier, as a serial achiever, right? In the yep. book. Yep. That, yep. That's your first yeah. Yeah. I think it's cool to be a serial achiever. Venus Williams, if I can drop another name. Yeah. She, she, you think of her as a tennis player, but she runs a design company for interior design. She has a clothing line and she does the design work for it. She's going back to school and get her master's in some other, she does all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, she credits her dad, basically, who she said when they were young, said, you cannot just be a tennis player. You are going to do other stuff. So they would ride in the car to tournaments and be in the backseat being forced to listen to these books on tape about, like, how to buy foreclosure properties, like, properties really? that had left. And wow. she said, you know, we're sitting there looking at each other like, why are we listening to this? But And her dad didn't expect them to become real estate moguls, but the idea was – there is more to this than tennis and I'm going to expose you to it. And so she said that the idea of being, it's, it's also what I call an and where you can be a break dancer and a ice hockey player and, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, but you can be an yeah. and, yeah. but most successful people that I know, you think of them for one thing, but if you scratch below the surface, they've got two or three other ands. Mm. And yeah. I think that helps you become more rounded and it's more satisfying and fulfilling too. Yeah. Cause I used to get the response from a lot of people and uh, even my family of uh, why didn't you continue doing that? You know, mm -hmm. I, got, I got it a lot when growing up when I was sort of playing high level sports and uh, you know, why do you keep jumping from, you know, hockey to basketball to tail tennis? Cause I would always get to a, a very high level, not, you know, and, and to the, when I feel like I've got 80% of the knowledge. Right. You know, and then, um, and then something inside me just wanted me to look outside and say, what's next right and i did that with my career you know i got a part-time job at an events company whilst i was trying to become a professional dancer and then all of a sudden i had this new challenge in front of me and then it was like try to be, become the best salesman and the best sales manager then the best sales director and then you know take on all of the portfolios or events that no one wanted right uh, all of the people that people were having trouble developing internally i'd say come on my team i'm gonna make you a superstar and it was like the same thing that came from the sort of the sports industry background and interests pulled into the career and somehow 10 years later i'm still i'm still <laughs> i'm still here i mean yeah. I, I don't think anyone would have thought that i'd be working with human resources directors but you never know because i didn't i tried it right and, I, and then as you said you realize that you like it and you yep. go on and, and if on. you don't if you give it enough time there is a difference between trying something and giving it enough time to realize that, you know what, this isn't for me versus that week or so where you go, wow, this isn't for me, but you're really deciding that because it's hard. Yeah. Not because it isn't for you. And you raise a really good point though about the serial achievement and doing different things. Sometimes organizationally companies tend to put people into a slot or a track. And so if you're in sales, then if we've invested some time and training in you in sales, then we've gotten you to that point. Well, we're going to keep you in the sales area. And I think that's a waste oftentimes. Some of the best people that I worked with, and I worked for a Fortune 500 company here in the U.S., some of the best people I worked with had two or three different tracks that they had been on where they went from sales to operations. Some of them went to HR. They went all over the place. And all of those things helped bring a lot of stuff together as opposed to, well, if we develop you into this area, then we've mm -hmm. got to stay with that. And, and yeah. I think that's hard on employees because had you been at my company and I put you on that sales track and you looked around and said, you know, this is really cool, but hey, they're doing this event and I'd like to be a part of that. And I said, nah, dude, you're sales. That's well, basically what happened in my... <laughs> well, you'd have gotten frustrated yes. and, and eventually you leave. That's what I was going to ask you, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Do you think that's the... I'm so happy you said that as well because one of the questions I wrote down was, do you think that's one of the reasons why sort of star players leave companies? Yeah, I do. I think that superstars are people, they're not just good at whatever it is you have them doing. They've got other interests. They've got other skills that they can apply because the stuff that makes you a superstar isn't necessarily skill dependent. It's work ethic, it's attitude, it's ability to network, it's ability to lead both informally and formally. There's all those pieces and parts that go with it. That's why they're so good. Not just because they have figured out how to close a sale. Yeah. For example. 
Mm -hmm. And so they have interests in other areas besides whatever track they are currently on. And if you keep them in that box, they're good enough that they can go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the superstars always have a choice. And yeah. so if you don't give them some latitude to express what they do or what they enjoy or what they're interested in, then they're going to make that choice and do it somewhere else. And it's not a risk for you as a company because you still have them. The guy that is awesome at sales, he's going to be awesome at something else. The lady that is awesome at one thing, she's going to be awesome at something else. That, that's just how that works. And so you, it's short-sighted to assume that, wow, you know, she's our top salesperson. We have to leave her there. Yeah. Because eventually she will go somewhere else. Yeah, because whenever I come across sort of a, a star player within a company that's been there for 20 years, you always see that they've moved laterally in the organization mm -hmm. yep. across different departments. You yep. It's very rare that you come across a sort of a, a, if I use a chief HR officer, that's been in the same company in the exact same role for, say, right. five, 10 years. Yep. They've gone, you know, outside the function, worked in different, different business units, different roles, specializing in different areas. And that's how the company's managed to keep them. Sure. And you always yeah. see that companies that lose talent after it's like, a, I think two years is like the average yeah. <laughs> time that people stay there until they get to the point where they're like, well, I'm not learning. I'm not challenged anymore. You know, I'm going to go somewhere else. And they do the same thing there. And it seems to be a trend. If you look, you can just look on LinkedIn at people's oh, yeah. profiles to see that trend um, yeah. directly as well. So very interesting. And so, it's also, it's also true. If I can, if I can make one other point, oh, go for it. the other thing, like if I use a manufacturing example, if you don't allow people to move around, then what ends up happening when you promote is you're promoting the best person at the lower, at the level below into the next job. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they've got the skills to do the next job. <clears throat> so from a manufacturing point of view, if you're a really good machine operator and you're the best one in the building and a supervisory role opens up, you'll probably get that job. But you may not be able to lead your way out of a paper bag. And just, you know, you were great on a craft <laughs> level, but you're not good on a leadership level. So when you open it up and allow people to move over, then if there's a supervisory opening and the person comes from say customer service, but they're a really good leader, they bring their leadership skills over. You can teach them the craft part of the job, yes. but the leadership part comes along with it and people can move to where they really should be. Otherwise, if you stay within those silos, then you're only promoting within the silo and, and eventually people top out because there are things that they don't have mm -hmm. that they really need. And I made that mistake. I would hire, I would promote the best person in a department. Yeah. And a month later, think, gosh, what have I done? And then it's really painful because if you demote them, yeah, then you're... everybody knows that they failed. Yeah. And they feel terrible and they are no longer good at the level that they go back to. Mm. And you feel bad because you hung somebody out to dry and should have known better. And it would have been much easier just to have had the conversation and said, you're really, really good at this. I don't think you have the skills to do that yet. So let's work on getting you those skills so that when a job comes open, you are ready. You know, as opposed to just, wow, you're the best one, let's move you up. Yeah. I've seen a lot of companies now changing the way they operate in terms of instead of promoting someone, they're sort of creating new roles where you obviously get a promotion financially, uh, right. but you're not necessarily becoming a manager. Maybe you're sort of a, a master right. specialist in yep. a particular area. And that seems to be now the way think things are moving and uh at one of our events recently we had uh, one of the questions was you know put your hand up if you've any, had any formal leadership training and bearing in mind these are all chros of, of global brands and about 80 percent of the room had no training whatsoever <laughs> so we're talking about chief hr officers leading you know brands sure. with over a hundred thousand employees and 80 percent of the room had no leadership training at wow. all and wow. people were, and people were wondering why i'm sorry not leadership, apologies, delegation, a training on how to delegate. Right. And they're now they've been in a role, right? And now which is a lot of leadership. <laughs> which is, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I was trying to be more specific. Yeah. Though, which yeah. is 100% a huge part, right? So they've been put, promoted into this role. They have no training on how to delegate. Uh, and we wonder why it's a big challenge. Um, sure. So going back to the point earlier, how, what can we, how do we start to begin to build uh, a structure and a process to continually motivate yourself or be motivated and achieve goals. What, okay. What's some tactical yeah. things that we can do? Sure. The, um, 
the premise of my book is basically for the individual. So like, it's for you to decide, Hey, I want to try this, you know, here's how I can do that. And then I, I do lay out some kind of processes for how people can adopt them so that you do get some of those guaranteed successes, mm -hmm. but you can flip it around. And so if I'm, if I'm training, say a new employee, the worst thing you can do is that typical onboarding process where you spend two or three days learning about policies, procedures, and the employee relations manual. And then you go out and you tour all the different departments and see what they do so you can get kind of the feel. You know, you end up at a week or a week and a half and you haven't actually done a thing. All you've done is be this sponge that theoretically absorbs. And to me, that's both boring, but it also does nothing towards getting you feeling like, hey, I'm starting to succeed. I know what to do here. The better approach is to do the, the little policies and procedure stuff as quick as you can so that they know what not to run afoul of mm -hmm. and then take out whatever part of the job is, break it down into little pieces and start training the pieces instead of the whole job and just say, okay, I'm going to teach you X. Doesn't take too long. And now let's let you go ahead and do X so that you can start to do it, learn what you're doing, have some success at it. You right away feel like you're contributing, which is very important. It's, it sucks to walk around the building yes. and be the guy who has a title, but not a job <laughs> and start to feel like you're contributing. And then that also gives you a framework for the other stuff that you learn because now you can apply it to something real as opposed to theoretical and then just keep doling out the training. So I guess what I'm saying is if a job has 50 tasks, train a couple, let them do them, train a few more, let them do them and build your way up to 50 in chunks as opposed to sitting them down like most companies do because training is something you just have to get out of the way and get over with and try <laughs> to, you know what I mean? And try yeah, to train sure. 50 and then yeah. say, okay, we've shown you everything you need to know, go forth and conquer. Yeah, you know, and by then you're like, oh, and then and I, I've seen that so many times in so many places. But the point of it is, if you can get people working and get them to where they can succeed and feel good about those little successes, one, it engages them, which is very important. But two, it makes the next time you teach them something kind of fun because it's like, okay, let me learn about that. Okay, let me learn about that. And I can do that and I can roll on. And you're a contributor rather than you know, the new person who has it's to be taken a few weeks do. before you feel like you've done anything at right. all or made it any impact. Um, yeah, yeah. That, I didn't that, that, that to me would be, that's probably the, the best tip that I can think of and very yeah. few companies do it, but the ones that do, it works spectacularly well. Yeah. Cause, because what you said is what I hear every single time. Every time I speak to a, a new leader is to just join the company. I'm like, what are you doing? How, how, how does your first few, months look like and that's what it is it's just being shown around different plant facilities you know having going into meetings and and, and policies etc but they're not really as you said they don't really having that they're not really feeling fulfilled that like they're contributing right. to the business and having those wins yep so really getting so what you're saying is get those wins as early on as possible yep. well the you know if you think about it if you've hired someone to do a job then you assume that they are going to return an equal or greater value for the pay that you give them. And that means that you have to actually have some sort of output. So why would you start sure. and go for two or three weeks where there's no output for a, from a person? Why would you set that tone early on? Why wouldn't you set the tone of, you know what? We're a company yeah. of doers. Mm, yeah. so, you know what? Right away, we're going to have you start doing stuff. We know that there are things we're going to still teach you. And let me explain the plan to you so that you don't feel that we're just going to show you one thing and then hang you out to dry. And you've got to figure it all out yourself. Here's how this is going to look, but we're a company of doers and we're going to get you doing right away because we know you are good at this and we know you're going to succeed and we want you to succeed. And if you approach it that way, then it's kind of fun and it's active as opposed to that passive, you know, let me sit in a room and, you know, get the feel of the company culture. Culture comes from doing, not from listening and not from posters. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, one thing I always ask you is uh, early in my career, one of the managers said to me, you know, you can't motivate your team, Chris. They have to want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and that's literally what you and i was like okay because uh, i was like, I, I, what, what do you because you know i would always do different things to the team and in my mind i thought i was motivating them mm -hmm. right whether it was setting goals team incentives just having one-on-one -on -one communication you know looking at their career progression etc etc you know and uh it always i was always sort of 
to have stuck with me. Do you, do you think that you can motivate someone to do something or do they have to re interested and be really so i'm not sure if i'm explaining this correctly no, i got you i think there are you know some, I mean? people, some, some people you cannot motivate yeah that's what i'm getting <laughs> absolutely there okay. is some subset of people that no matter what you try yeah it's not going to work and and if that is the case they kind of need to go then there's another subset of people on the other end of the scale who it doesn't matter what you do they've got that internal this is who i am this is what i do I'm almost going to succeed in spite of you. <laughs> if you are a detriment, you've got that subset. The people in the middle are the ones where you're really making your money as a leader. And it's the, you know, their, their tendency is to work hard and try and, and work together, but you have to kind of lay the foundation. And unfortunately there's not one answer for every person. Mm -hmm that works for the entire group. But if you have expectations, oh, this is going to sound so platitudinous, so forgive me. But if they know their expectations, they know what you want them to do. They know why they're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And they feel that that is part of helping them achieve something that they want to achieve. I always say that if you've got company goals, if you can find a way to make them feel like personal goals as well, yeah. then that's cool. So if growth is your goal, and I realized that if the company grows, then I have a chance to move into other positions or get opportunities and stuff. And I have more of a vested interest, for example. Um, yeah. Then that, that's where you have to go in the middle, but it, there's no, it's part art and part science, obviously. And everything you just described that you would do to try to motivate your group, it works on some people, some slices of that work on different people. And your job as a leader is to figure out what it is that helps keep your folks individually focused and motivated and interested and engaged and mm -hmm. deliver that. You can't just yeah. do it in one meeting once a month, you no. know, raise your fist and sing a song and go one back side, out again. Yeah. There's never a one size fits all. Nah, approach. I nah. learned that I, I didn't have any training. I, I was in a company where I was like, okay, you're, you're one of the, one of the best performing people. We're going to make you a manager. <laughs> and then well, I realized every single piece of uh, skill that I'd learned had nothing to do with managing people no. <laughs> right. going back. And uh, what kind of, I said, what, what, I'll say what saved me, but really was coming across the why, you know, I know yep. you talk about yep. the Simon Sinek and, 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 and yep. the why, and that stuck with me. Yep. And, and if I could make sure I had the why of every single person on the team and I, and, and I understood that, then I, then I can sort of, but then I can influence people. Yeah. Everybody's why is different too. Sometimes it's, yes, exactly. you know, I want to feed my family. Sometimes it's, I want to be perceived as the big dog in yeah. the field. Sometimes it's the one, sometimes the why is just, I don't want you to treat me poorly or make me feel disrespected or sometimes that's their why. There's all kinds of different ones, but they tend to be pretty simple. Yeah. Once you kind of figure out, you know, Hey, this guy, wants to be treated this way. This person likes that. This one hates it when I recognize her publicly, but mm -hmm. loves a quiet word of thanks. And wow, you really saved me. You know, there's all those little things. And that's, that's part of being a leader as opposed to a supervisor or a manager. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that you mentioned in the book, which really stood out to me as well, was the, when you talk about um, going to a pro, not a coach. <laughs> talking yeah, getting I've, getting I've getting a a lot, i've gotten a lot of heat for that I, I, and you know what I, i'm so get, get it because in, again it's something which when you when you say it, it sort of it sparks, it sparks <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of thought and uh, i can understand why you had that but could you could you elaborate on that in terms yeah. of getting yeah, a pro and not on a, not a coach yeah i'll use a non-business um, <laughs> analogy first um let's let's go back to let's say you you feel like you're out of shape and you want to get in better shape so you go to your local gym and there's a trainer there and you say, Hey, I, I want to get in better shape, which is a terrible goal because it's meaningless. You know, what does get in better shape mean? But nonetheless, you, you know, you talk about, you know, yourself and they ask you about your feelings or what you like to do and all that stuff. And so you end up with this program that is sugar coated for your interests and levels. But if your goal was, well, let's pretend it's to run a marathon. There are certain things you are going to have to do and certain training you're going to have to undertake in order to be able to run 26 miles. That's just life. And so your better bet in that case is not to go someone who, to someone who will tell you what you want to hear, but to go to someone that will just be cold and clinical and say, okay, you want to do that? And this is where you're starting from? If I was you, this is what I would do. 
And typically that is a person who has done that and done that successfully and knows what it takes. So in business terms, you know, if you're, if you're talking to uh, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur coach, sorry about starting a business and the only business he's ever started is his own as a coach. Well, okay. I'm not sure what you get there. So I guess my point is there yeah. are good coaches undoubtedly of course and the ones that have called me and emailed me to say wait a minute you're disparaging my profession you know i forgive me but the best how do i say this there are lots of perfectly good wheels out there that you don't need to reinvent so if you have something that you want to accomplish look at the people who have accomplished it look at how they did it get down to the nitty-gritty part and then say okay that is a perfect path that may not be guaranteed to get me there, but if I work really hard, I'm going to get really close. And then there may be a few little course corrections that you have to make to accommodate you as an individual, because we are all a little different, but we're not nearly as different as we like to think we are. And, but if you follow that, you're going to get there. So I wrote an example in the book. I, I decided I wanted to run this grand fondo. Those are mass participation yeah. cycle events. And there was one that, and I'd never ridden a bike other than as a kid. And so it was a hundred miles and four mountains and 11,000 feet of climbing. And, you know, it was this awful, horrible thing. And I had like four months to do it. And so I went to the guy who's a professional mountain biker who it's his event. And I said, I want to ride your event. And he said, Oh, you're going to do it next year. And I said, no, I really want to do it this year. He said, <laughs> he looked at me, he laughed and he said, are you serious? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, you only have four months. And I said, yeah. And he took me for this quick little ride and we got done. And he said, dude, you can't do this. And I said, I really want to try. What would I have to do if I want to do this? And he said, okay. And so he laid out my plan. And the first day I had to go ride for three hours. And the farthest I'd ridden before that was about 15 minutes. It was awful, but it was guaranteed that if I did the work, I could get to the other end. And I, I rode it and actually finished about mid pack, which surprised me, felt pretty good when it was over. It was actually a really cool experience and it was gratifying also because it was hard and I had to work hard and it felt like I had accomplished something, not in front of other people. I didn't care about that. Grand Fondos aren't about the people watching. It's about you and you getting through, but I felt really good about it. And the cool thing was that goes back to my thing about get a pro, not a coach. If you do what you know other people have done that will get them to a certain place, and if you do that, that's pretty empowering because you know you can make it. Most of the time you can make that. And so ever since then, if I want to do something that's really hard, I just think back and say, well, you know, I did that in four months. I got ready for that. I can do it. It's just a matter of time and effort and having the right process to follow, not the sugar coated one, not the soft one, but the one that will actually get me there. So that, I know that was really long winded and I apologize. No, I like the, I like the, 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 the premise yeah. is don't just ask somebody for their advice and it's kind of soft and loose and fuzzy and whatever. Look around for someone who has actually done what you want to do and they don't even have to coach you. If you can figure out what their process was, adopt it and commit to it and stick with it for a week or two, like I said early on, and you'll start to get those little successes and that will help you get the motivation to kind of keep going. And if you're not willing to do it that way and you want the soft way, I, as far as I'm concerned, don't even start because you're not going to get there and you're going to feel defeated and frustrated. And then you're probably going to sit back and say, okay, well, I just wasn't motivated enough in the first place. And so I better wait until I find my passion, but you can turn something into a passion if you yeah. work at it. And also it, you don't need to recreate something that already exists. No, no. And, <laughs> I think that's a lot of people try to do, don't they? They try to recreate, try to create something what there's already, it's already been done. <laughs> yep. And yep. of course you may have to dissect it a little bit and understand exactly the process of how they got there, but it's a proven plan. And as you said, most of the time it's going to be very hard, but that's exactly what that's un unfortunately, that's what it takes right. to, to achieve the result. Whereas if you had a, in, in terms of the gym example, a personal trainer, there's no mm -hmm. way they're going to say, go out and do two and a half hours no. on a bike in your first day. It's not no. going to happen. <laughs> so no. They're not going to do that. They're going to say slowly increase, right. you know, take your time. You don't, right. it, it's just, and I think that's going to be the same in business, right? 
Yeah, and then um, the problem is, if you take that softer approach, I know I'm making it sound like this is all kind of draconian and harsh, and it's really not, but if you take that softer approach, you're not going to get those successes that will help you feel like, hey, I feel good about myself. I've set out to do something and I'm starting to accomplish it. That gives you the motivation. You're just going to kind of flounder along. And then because you're not feeling good about yourself and because you're not seeing any results, you're going to quit because now you're forcing yourself to have just total willpower to keep you going every day in spite of the fact that you're getting no results. And that, you know, I don't care how much willpower you think you have, you will not get through that. <laughs> Nobody's getting through that. You was talking as well in, uh, about um, how people talking about achieving something sometimes gives them gratification just by talking oh. <laughs> about it. And then yeah. therefore, it's more likely that they're not going to actually go right. and yeah. start that because they've already got the the endorphins. I don't know how you would yeah. describe it. Yeah, there's, there's research that shows that if you, let's say that you've, I don't know, I feel, like, I feel like I do it. When, when I heard you say it, I feel like I've, I've said so many times that to my friends, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I get really excited about it, and then I don't do it. And as soon as you said that, I was like, I think that's me. <laughs> well, the, the idea of it was, you know, there's this idea that peer pressure helps you keep on to your goals so that yes. you get an accountability buddy or something that will hold you to We're stuff. doing it right now in 2018. Right. Everyone's doing and it online. <laughs> but I do feel like there's value to that. But the difference is there's a lot of research that shows – that if the way you talk about it is at the end result, like I'm going to, I don't know, let's say run a marathon again. You know, I'm going to run, I'm going to run the New York city marathon. You know, I can't wait. It's going to be really cool at the starting line. I'm going to get these cool shoes. I can't wait to get my finisher medal. You know, if you talk about all that stuff, what happens is that somewhere inside you, it is almost as if you were there. It's a little bit like that research that shows that planning a vacation can be just as satisfying and makes people as happy as actually taking it because you're picturing yourself there. And so because you've gotten some of the little kick out of, hey, wow, I'm going to run the marathon, you're a little less motivated to do it because you've gotten some of the fun already. So if you want an accountability buddy, the way to go is to not talk about I'm going to be or do this thing at the end. The thing to do is talk about here's what I'm going to do to get there and hold me to that. So this is my process. This week I'm going to run three miles a day, four days this week, and on Sunday I'm gonna go for six. Check in with me the, at the end of the week and make sure I did those things. If you want an accountability buddy, it ought to be on the process, not on the end result. So if it's writing a book, okay, don't talk about, have you finished your book yet? Because you're gonna say, well, no, but I'm getting there and I'm trying really hard and it's coming along, you know, I've had some roadblocks. Say, you know, I plan to write 2,000 words this week. Did you write your 2,000 words? Really? Why not? <laughs> That's the accountability yeah. that you're looking for. The accountability is for process, not for end result. Because that phenomenon you just described, you get that little endorphin kick you out of, all the time. I'm already there. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, well, I'm going skiing next month, right? And uh, we're, get, we're getting really excited about it. But we were excited before we even booked, <laughs> we yeah. booked it. And, everything, and then we forgot about it completely. And I was like... <laughs> I was like, didn't we say, didn't we, and we hadn't booked the flights, we hadn't <laughs> did everything. So it basically needed didn't happen because we were so caught up in the, the yeah. excitement of everything. And um, it was fun to plan. It was. It was fun to talk about. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, but it does mean that it's a little harder to carry through because you're getting a little bit of that success kick early on. Mm -hmm. It's a well, weird thing. Yeah. One of the other things I think you mentioned as well, which was about the wording of saying, oh. I, of, I, of, uh, I think you, you're saying, you know, I can't right. do this. Right. Uh, and could you explain a bit more about that, about the, the difference between yeah. how, how yeah. people, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's research that shows, well, this researchers did this study and it was people that were, they wanted them to accomplish a health and fitness kind of a goal. And so they said, you know, we got a two week period and we want you to stick to this program. And so they had three different groups. One group was told, you know, whenever you're struggling with your willpower to, to do what you need to do, say to yourself, you know, I can't miss this workout. Mm -hmm. Another group was told to say, I don't miss workouts. And another group wasn't given any st coping strategy at all. So at the end of the two week period, the I, the non-coping strategy people, three out of 10 of them actually achieved their goal. Okay, not bad. 
On the I can't group, only one out of 10 accomplished the goal. So saying I can't was actually worse than having no strategy at all. And out of the I don't people, it was something like six or eight accomplished it. So the, the idea behind it was if you say I can't have another piece of cake, you're making a choice. You're saying, well, I can't. Well, but then you can have that little self argument. Well, I can't, but then again, you know, tomorrow I'll go running and I'll burn those calories off. And so, you know what? Yeah, I can have that piece of cake. If you're the kind of person that just says, you know, I'm, I'm training for a marathon and I don't eat desserts because it's part of my deal, then it's an identity thing. So like, for instance, if you have kids, no one ever says, you know, I can't neglect my kids. <laughs> they say, I don't, because that's who you are. Yeah. You, know, you say, I don't. If you're I don't know, if you're a vegan, you don't eat meat. It's not that you can't, you just don't because it's your identity. And so that idea of saying, I want to become something. And so therefore to become that, I don't do certain things is a very powerful message to yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're a leader, if you say, you know, I, I can't make an, let's say unethical choice. Well, then you're almost saying, well, well let's talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you leave, you're leaving it open for an yeah, open yeah. interpretation. If you, or and, if you, and if you've got a willpower or a determination struggle going on inside of you, then that opens it up for you to get a little weak and make a mistake. But if you say, I don't, then that's it. That's just um, who you are. That's what you are. And eventually when you get to this place where, you know, like say with leadership, if you start out as a supervisor or a manager. You, you know the processes, hopefully if you've been trained, even though you didn't get trained, <laughs> but you know the processes, but you're kind of doing things. But at some point when you learn what you're doing, you learn how to do your job, you learn how to, you learn how to do it, you become a leader. And so you've become a leader. You do the managing, but you become the leader. And if you get to that point, then it's really easy to say, I don't treat people that way, or I don't fail to follow up or, you know, whatever it may be, because that's who you are. And so the whole I don't thing is all about becoming, which I, it's another part of my book, but that's the cool thing about taking these paths and trying to succeed at something along the way you switch over from a person who is, you know, hoping to run a marathon, you become a runner, you know, for you, I, this will be a bad example, but you know, you, you switch over from being a guy who tried to skate and handle a puck at the same time yeah. to becoming an ice hockey player. Yeah. You know, and it becomes part of your example. identity. Yeah. And, and the cool thing about that where it goes farther is that that automatically lets you feel like you're part of a greater community. You know, because when you're a break dancer, there's a community mm -hmm. sense to that. When yeah. you're a hockey player, there's a community sense. And that's a really cool feeling. And all of us are searching for that identity and that sense of belonging and of mattering. And when you become something and you get to be part of that community, that's a really cool thing. And it's also motivational because that's part of your identity. You almost don't need motivation because that's what, just what you do. If you're a parent, do you have to be motivated in the morning <laughs> to take care of your kids? No. <laughs> you may not always love doing it. And I have four of them, so I know. Mm. But you don't you may not always love doing it, but it's what you do and it's who you are. And so if you get along this path of learning to do something well and getting to the place where you've achieved, you've become something, then it becomes part of you. And it's a really cool thing. And if you go to the serial achiever route and you go and do something else, that's okay because you carried that other part with you. So you probably still think of yourself as a break dancer and a hockey player. I do. And you think of yourself as those things and you do, never, yeah. you don't ever have to give it up. It is yeah. always part of you. You carry it with you forever. Hmm. But it, it seems that the, um, I don't want to sort of call myself a serial achiever in some ways, but it seems that I, I, now I'm aware of why I did those things and why mm -hmm. I, I moved on. That is something empowering about that. Mm -hmm. But next time I consciously choose to, do do something new i can i can really break it down for myself and understand now i know um why i sort of pushed myself to do those things and you know whilst everyone my friends who i used to i used to drive even my business partner i used to drive his parents crazy because <laughs> i used to skateboard up and down the alleyway where they live until like two in the morning whilst my friends my friends will be asleep and I'll be outside practicing my tricks all night long. And everyone was like, you, what is wrong with you? And, and it was just that obsession of, of being, getting good at failing, 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 and keep doing it. And I realized when I joined, when I, when I sort of got my first job, 
that I took that same sure. mentality with me, but I wasn't conscious of that at the time. Actually, actually, there's some, I, I wish I could put my finger on it right now, but I've seen studies that show that like skateboard kids turn out to be outstanding like either employees or entrepreneurs or other stuff because they are really, really good at breaking something down, figuring out how to, how it works, but then also accepting the a lot of endless <laughs> amount of failure <laughs> that so goes <laughs> with getting to the other end. And so, you know, they walk into something new and they're not intimidated at all because it's like, well, yeah. okay. So it's a matter of time and effort. I can I think there. I think that's why I connected with sales early on. Um, I, I didn't know at the time, but literally. Oh, that's a perfect example. Yeah, literally, because, yeah. you know, you, you spend 90% of your day getting a no. Yep. Um, and, and literally, I would, for me to learn one trick, I would literally fail a thousand times. Sure. Um, probably more, just to right. learn one new trick. And then the satisfaction, it, you forget immediately about the failures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Away. And that was the same thing within sales, whereas a lot of people will immediately they have their first no and they take it personally and then it becomes uh, something they embed in themselves and, and very quickly they, they fail. Whereas a lot of the people that succeeded on my team were sports people, ex-army. Yep. A lot yeah. of guys come from the army uh, onto the team. And, you know, they were like, this is, this is your idea of stress. <laughs> right. I've, been in, I'm, I've been a medic in, the, in right. the army and you guys are getting stressed out about someone saying no to you. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, if you, see, if you can learn to see failure as part of the process and it's just yeah. part of how it works, it, does, it almost isn't failure anymore. It's not. And you don't, I, I you don't put that failure. word. Yeah, you don't yeah, put that word with it. It's, it's just this is part of the process. I'm going to talk to 50 people mm. and I might get one but I'm going to get one and cool. Yeah. yeah. We go. It's exactly the same with a podcast. You know, we, 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 in five months, we are close to our 50, 50th guest, um, in, in, in five months and, uh, we've got 10,000 subscribers and, uh, so how, how did you do it, Chris? But no one saw the oh. thousand messages <laughs> that I sent out to get four, to get 50 people. Sure. You know, no one un sees that part, but they yeah. see, the end result and i think it's such a powerful message for people and one of the reasons i was so interested in speaking to you about this is that so many people that oh, over the christmas period i spoke to were um sort of young young friends were sort of leaving university saying i don't know what to do now and uh my first my first thing was you know just taste as many things as you can mm -hmm. just do, and then you know what you like and then you know then you'll become motivated by it and it really clicked with what you were you were you were talking about um as well so but we can talk about this all day <laughs> yeah well it, it's really funny though and if i can just add your example about your podcast you know i i write for ink and i i average about i don't know a million and a half a million points 1.7 or so million readers a month wow a lot of people but that wasn't always like that of course, but no one <laughs> you know, remembers I, that i wrote i wrote some <laughs> stuff that maybe a hundred people read you know and i would sit there and think wow i just i spent a while on that <laughs> it was really good yeah. you know this was I, I put a lot of effort into that and nobody's reading it but it it takes time it does it takes effort and you know it it is before we even started i it sometimes it's all about reps it's all about repetitions and mm -hmm. staying the course and figuring you'll get better so your strike rate gets much better you know yeah. as a sales well, person it may be a numbers game, but your strike rate will get better, mm -hmm. but you have to put in the reps or you're not going to get there. And so, sure. but that's your exempt, your advice to younger folks that are just going out into the workforce. You don't have to, don't look around and say, all right, I have to find the perfect job that has the perfect path or yeah. I should take it. Just yeah. take a job, Let's take a job, see what happens, <laughs> yeah. learn something, add to your resume you know, it's a process, not like a one path. Yeah. It's something that's, I don't think, spoken about enough. Um, definitely not so, uh, from, from, from what I've seen around me. So, you know, I, I accidentally just thought, oh, I'll get a job in sales. Why not? Mm -hmm. No. Um, and I didn't know that if it was going to be good or not. And luckily it was something that I, I really enjoyed. And uh, now I'm speaking to HR directors every day. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's say that you, <laughs> let's say you took the sales job and you did it for a year and you didn't like it and you went to do something else. Sales skills are something that everybody needs, even if it's just to convince other people that you work with that your idea makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you don't waste any of that. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets wasted. 
Yeah, so that is it, true. It's, it's experiences true. and it's learning and it's figuring it out. And, you know, only in hindsight will your path look like it made sense. <laughs> but fun. it will make sense because you'll be able to connect those dots and say, wow, but when I did that, it was because I have done that and it was because I've done that before that and all that stuff works out in hindsight, but it, it's messy as crap. In the, in it's the, true. And that's okay. And that's yeah. actually kind of cool. The messier it is sometimes, the better it turns out. But yeah, again, but it's it, when I started the, um, my own company as well, I realized all of the skills from all the different jobs I had over the years is what contributed to me being able to succeed. Not just yep. one, you right. know, I was thinking you about- You didn't plan that. No, not <laughs> no. at all. But it took you to where you should be. Yeah, no problem. Well, look, Jeff, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you, sir. I think we can continue talking about this all day long. I feel sure. <laughs> um, give our listeners one parting piece of guidance and oh. uh, also the best way to get in touch with you and, and find out more about the work you're doing. Wow, one parting piece of guidance. Uh, let's do the easy part first. Uh, my website's jeffhayden.com. It's H-A-D-E-N. I write for Inc. Magazine. That's Inc.com. If you go there and search my name, you'll see way more articles than you will ever want to read. Um, <laughs> and I'm, have an, time to. <laughs> I'm an influencer on LinkedIn. So if you find me there, I'm happy to connect. Um, I actually really enjoy that. Um, I have like 950,000 followers on LinkedIn and that's really cool, but I like the connection. I like the connection part. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, parting advice. Okay. Here's, here's mine for HR folks. Cause that's who's listening. Yeah. It's my, my line will be numbers come and go, but feelings are forever. So if you are part of some project or some initiative and the numbers look great and it seems like it makes sense and the ROI is fine and all the justification stuff is peachy, but it is going to in some way impact either the morale or the, the dignity or any of that stuff of your employees, then take another look because you can get numbers in other ways. But the first time that you make a, feel, a person feel like a number or that they are, not, they are not treated with dignity or respect, you have probably lost them forever. And so that would be my line. Numbers come and go, but feelings are forever. Fantastic. Well, look, guys, make sure you head over to hrdleaders.com. I'll link up everything we've mentioned in the show notes there. Also a link to, to, to the book. Uh, definitely got to get one myself. I think it's actually sold out on Amazon right now, right? Or is it pre-order? <laughs> uh, it is, it just came out on Tuesday and I, I, I think, I think they are back ordered right now. So that that's a good, good sign. That is good for me. <laughs> that's it's, a good it's sign. bad though, because if somebody wants to order and they don't see well, it, look, sometimes, I, they, don't, sometimes link, they don't come back. You know? <laughs> I'm going to link it up that right in the description so everyone can see that as well. Awesome. Um, that's great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And, you um, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot. I wish you all, all the best until we next week. Thanks.